Hey there, I'm Veronica from Urbane Cyclist and today we're looking at some commonly asked questions about disc brakes. If you've been in a bike shop recently, you may or may not have noticed that most bikes now come with disc brakes. For many people, disc brakes are a new concept and this can make them a bit daunting. They are not as standard as many people may think and this only gets more complicated when dealing with the various different naming conventions of aftermarket parts from different brands. There are tons of considerations and variables, so we're hoping to give you some good information that can help you out when dealing with sourcing replacement parts. We've tried to break this down as simply as possible and put the content into subsections that will hopefully help you to navigate and review the whole video more easily. First of all, disc brakes don't always inherently mean better performance. This is often tied to the quality of the brake itself. Most inexpensive disc brake systems might not actually be an upgrade from a good quality rim brake. There are loads of variables involved in evaluating what makes a good brake, but we'll take a look at broad features before digging into the finer details. So why disc? One of the biggest benefits to disc brakes is braking consistency. Disc brakes have a much smaller braking surface with the brake pads gripping into a disc rotor. It's also at hub height on the wheel, meaning that it's higher off the ground than a rim and therefore less affected by adverse riding conditions like rain and moisture and grit and dirt. And rotors are also much more inexpensive and simpler to replace than rims are. The smaller surface area on a rotor also clears dirt and grit much faster because of the size. Most disc brake systems will also offer more modulation and control over rim brakes. The first factor we're going to look at between different disc brake systems is the actuation style. Some disc brake systems use steel brake cables, just like traditional rim brakes, while others use fluid, usually dot fluid or mineral oil. These are called hydraulic brakes. Hydraulic brakes will usually offer increased stopping power with less force applied at the hand when compared to cable actuated brakes. The brake lever has a reservoir of fluid, and when it's pulled, that pushes a piston, increasing the pressure throughout the hydraulic brake line, which in turn pushes out pistons on either side of the rotor. These pistons move the brake pads inwards towards the rotor, allowing them to make contact. One benefit of these types of systems is that they apply balanced pressure, and because both pads move into the rotor, the rotor and pads all wear more evenly. Cable actuated disc brakes work just like traditional rim brakes where a lever pulls a steel cable, which in turn pulls an arm that actuates the brake pads. These systems are also called mechanical disc brakes. These are often considered a little more simple for the home mechanic to work on because the corrosive and caustic fluids associated with hydraulics are not involved. Most capable DIY bike repair people should have ready access to the appropriate tools to make basic adjustments to cable actuated brakes. There's also a third system that combines the two styles, cable actuated hydraulic. These systems have a reservoir at the caliper that is actuated by a steel cable and the pistons activate a traditional hydraulic system. Why would you choose to use a hybrid system? Before hydraulic disc brakes were popularized on road and gravel bikes, they were often used as aftermarket upgrades. Since most road and gravel bikes have integrated shifters and brakes, commonly referred to as brifters or SCI shifters, this was a way to maintain the shifting function without upgrading or changing more parts and allowed you to maintain regular cable routing that the bike comes stock with, all while greatly increasing your braking performance. When we're looking at cable actuated disc brakes, there are a couple different caliper styles, dual and single actuation. Both have potential pros and cons. Single actuated cable brakes only move a single brake pad when the lever is pulled. One very popular version you'll see on many beautiful custom bikes would be the Paul Clamper. Paul cites that this allows for better stopping power and modulation since their inner mechanics can be larger and more robust. Shrinking them down to fit on both sides of the rotor can limit the maximum force. In the Paul design, you still get to dial in and adjust where the inner pad sits, similar to an Avid BB7, but with a really robust design. The rotor will flex inwards towards the stationary pad. While this does wear the pad and rotor a little less evenly, these are, these are all parts that would be exposed to everyday wear and tear anyway, and this would only be a marginal difference to the normal wear and wouldn't contribute to unnecessary repair. 
Dual actuated cable brakes move both brake pads inward simultaneously when the brake lever is pulled. One of the most popular dual actuated designs we see would be the TRP Spire. These are a very popular choice for dual actuated cable disc brakes. They don't tend to have as noticeable of a bite as the Paul Clamper design, but they're very easy to set up and the pads wear very evenly, along with the rotor, since both sides are getting equally utilized. When you hear folks talking about disc brakes, you may hear short versus long or road versus mountain. These are actually two ways of talking about the same thing. Road bikes traditionally use caliper brakes. Some use cantilever braking systems, which are both short or road cable pull. In the early days of mountain biking, cantilever brakes, along with other styles of short pull brakes, were often used for their increased tire clearance, but they lack the stopping power needed for bombing down mountainsides. This is why you'll sometimes see huge extra long brake levers that look like they came off a motorbike used on early mountain bikes. Adding more leverage at the brake lever only made marginal increases in braking power for short pull brake systems, and later, V-brakes were developed. These are also known as linear pull, long pull, and sometimes mountain pull. They use a longer leverage ratio at the lever and caliper to increase overall brake power. These brakes were the standard on most commuter and consumer bikes for decades. And now, the most important thing to keep in mind when you're looking at your brakes is to make sure your brake levers and calipers match. On most road bike or drop bar levers, unless otherwise noted, they're short pull, and flat bar levers can work either way. So, take note and make sure your brake lever and your brakes match. Rotors are another one of those things with bikes where the difference doesn't matter all that much until you need to replace them. Six bolt rotors use, as you may have guessed, six bolts to attach each rotor to the hub. These bolts each have a T25 Torx head. They're pretty easy to install, but if you are an all weather rider, it's worth thinking about corrosion. Bolts can rust and seize in place and a broken bolt on your hub is generally no fun. Center lock rotors and hubs use either a cassette lock ring tool or an external bottom bracket tool to install and remove them. You can also buy adapters that allow you to run six bolt rotors on center lock hubs. These are also a bit quicker to install or remove, but the tools you require are larger. So if you think you'll need to install or remove things on the side of the road or on the go, six bolt might be a little more convenient. Rotors will come in various sizes and are most commonly available in 160 millimeters for gravel and road. There are also 140 millimeters, 180 millimeters, 203 millimeters, and even 220 millimeters. Larger rotor sizes are usually used for more extreme riding conditions like downhill mountain biking. Rotors will also have a minimum thickness recommendation. This is usually printed directly on them so you can keep track of the right time to replace them. There are a few different ways of mounting disc brake calipers to your bike frame. The type you'll need is dependent on the type of mount on your frame. Understanding these different brake mount styles is the key to selecting the correct brake adapter for your bike. They are flat mount, post mount, and IS mount. Flat mount brakes are the outlier in the set as most road and gravel frames going forward are using this as their standard. With most flat mount forks, there will be an adapter that sits between the brake caliper and the fork leg. This adapter is what allows different sizes of rotors to be used. A flat mount fork will have two bolt holes spaced 70 millimeters apart. On road and gravel bikes, it's common to see 140 to 160 millimeter rotors, which is what the adapter allows the adjustment of. You'll also see flat mount referred to as through bolt or flat mount 34 millimeter, which is another way to approach the flat mount interface. The fork and caliper would mount directly to each other through two holes spaced 34 millimeters apart, leaving a very clean look, but you can still adapt it to use different rotor sizes. Both flat mount orientations will have holes in the frame perpendicular to the axle. Post mounts will have a little more offset from the axle and the bolt holes are spaced 74 millimeters apart. They're also perpendicular to the axle. Follow the manufacturer's guidelines to determine if you need an adapter to run specific sizes of rotors. Also take note if there's a maximum rotor size listed and don't go beyond that. It's also worth noting that there are some adapters available to run post mount brakes on flat mount frames. 
IS mount is a little smaller and is notable because the bolt holes are parallel to the axle and 51 millimeters apart. This standard for brakes isn't actively used, but the simplicity of manufacturing on frames and forks keep them in production. These will require an adapter, and since most modern brakes are post mount, you would normally just need to follow your manufacturer's guidelines or use adapters if supplied. If not, use a post mount to IS mount adapter for your intended rotor size. We've talked about the brake calipers, but now we're going to look at the brake pads. Naming can be a bit confusing with the materials of disc brake pads, but the first thing you should look out for is your rotor compatibility. Some rotors are described as resin only, so it's important to understand the variables and names found on common pad compounds. Resin and organic mean the same thing as semi-metallic. These are a mixture of some fibers with some metal. They have a more apparent bite on the rotor while being less abrasive on the rotor's material and also quieter during normal operation. Metal or sintered pads are metallic compounds that are blended together. Metal pads are generally louder but offer enhanced stopping power overall and perform well in a variety of weather conditions. Because of the grip that these offer, they also require rotors that are rated for metal pads. Possibly one of the biggest frustrations with disc brakes is the seemingly limitless variation of sizes and shapes they come in. If you're used to rim brakes, there are usually a few options available, but they're usually also cross compatible. Between variable shapes, terminology and naming conventions, this is undoubtedly one of the most seemingly simple but very confusing aspects of modern disc brake equipped bikes. When sourcing replacement brake pads, it's first a really good idea to look at the brake caliper. It should have a model number and brand on it. Brands often stick to a few shapes in their lineup, so as you're trying to determine which replacements you'll need, this is a great way to eliminate some of the varieties. If you've got a relatively new bike, you can also check the spec sheet to see if the brake make and model are listed. Let's say, for example, we have a Shimano BRMT200 brake that we're trying to find a replacement pad for. This one's a little tricky because the model number is very small and embossed black on black on the caliper and lever, so it's not that easy to spot while it's on the bike. This is a great time to use your bike spec sheet if you have access to it. If you can't physically see which model, a fairly safe way to determine which pad the brake uses is to remove it. This brake uses one of the most common shapes offered by Shimano, the B05S. This is also the same shape as the now defunct B03S or B01S, but with a longer wear life. If you still have trouble determining which pad is right, you can always bring it to your local bike shop and provide them with as much info as possible, like the brand of your brakes. For us, you can send over a detailed photo and an email, and we'll send you a link to which brake pad is best for you. Just because you have a Shimano branded brake, it doesn't mean you're stuck exclusively using Shimano branded brake pads. There are some exceptional offerings from other brands such as Jaguar or Coolstop with really excellent compounds, along with specialty brake pads for e-bikes with even longer wear cycles. Some of the more standardized shapes you'll see in use by brands like TRP are also using the Shimano B05S shape. You can see this on the very popular Spire brakes. You'll also see the same shape standard used by SRAM, Avid, and Juicy Brakes on the Paul Clampers. Things can get a little more tricky with smaller off-brands that may not offer as much documentation or brand recognition from your local bike shop. When all else fails, doing a visual matchup can be very helpful. It never hurts to keep your receipt either once you track down the correct brake pads for your own reference or even hanging onto your old used pads for a visual reference so you don't always have to dismantle your brakes to confirm your pad compatibility. When all else fails or if you don't want to DIY, going to visit your local bike shop is the fail-safe solution. You can trust them to not only source the correct parts but to guarantee it's installed correctly. If you made it this far, we have a couple more extremely important final notes on disc brakes. Always avoid touching your rotors and brake pads with your bare hands, and definitely avoid using spray lubricants. Even the oils on your skin can be enough to contaminate your rotors or your brake pads. Keep this in mind when washing your bike too. A pressure washer can redirect oil from your drivetrain onto the rotors. 
If you're traveling with a bike that has hydraulic brakes or if you ever just want to take the wheel out, do not pull the brake lever without the rotor in place. This can cause the pistons to overextend and lock together, making it much more complicated to reassemble your bike and reattach your wheel. We hope you learned some useful information about disc brakes on bikes. We tried to be as comprehensive as possible, but please let us know if you have any of your own tips and tricks, or if you have any questions you'd like to add in the comments. Thanks for watching and see you next time.